Start. Yeah, we are live. Okay. Thank you. Uh, dear panelists, participants, and organizers, a very good afternoon to everyone. And once again, welcome to this conference on responsible AI for social empowerment, RAISE 2020, a global summit on AI organized by Ministry of Electronics and IT, Government of India. Myself, Ranjana Nagpal, Senior DDG and Scientist G at National Informatics Center. I'm heading the digital agriculture initiatives in the government with a vision and mission to build a comprehensive platform for complete gamut of services in agriculture and allied sectors. Next to us, I would be your host for the session on building a future ready agriculture supply chain with AI. According to UN, by 2050, the population in the world is going to grow from 7.7 .7 billion to 9.7 billion. Food and nutrition has to be ensured for ever-growing human population across the globe. As we all understand, agriculture is highly dependent on nature, global warming, or any localized disaster or calamity has direct impact on agricultural production. Therefore, technological intervention in this domain is the need of the art. Due to its vastness and complexity, one cannot think of a uniform or single solution across the board. The issues may vary from nutrient availability in soil, ensuring best and most suited quality of inputs like seeds variety, fertilizers, pesticides, water, or managing a network of suppliers. Data capturing for smart farming, market intelligence solutions, to smart retail, and so on. These are few of the uh, few listings of challenges that we face in agriculture sector. So the canvas is very big, but our researchers and innovators have provided a number of excellent solutions and set direction in the domain of precision agriculture. Today we have with us a highly eminent panel of speakers who would share with us their insights on the subject. It's my pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker for this session, Dr. Padmanabhan Anandan, CEO of Vadwani Institute for Artificial Intelligence, a nonprofit research institute. Dr. Anandan is a renowned researcher in the field of computer vision and artificial intelligence, whose career spans more than 30 years in academia and industry. He was the founder and managing director of Microsoft Research India and professor of AI at Yale University. He is a distinguished alumnus of IIT Metros and a member of board of governors of IIT Metros. I request Dr. Anandan to deliver his keynote address. Yeah. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon. I am going to uh, share my screen so you can see the presentation, and I'll uh, talk during uh, during that. Okay. We assume the presentation is visible to the audience. Uh, yes, yeah. Let me go full screen. Yeah, first of all, I want to thank uh, Meiti, Niti Ayog, and Digital India for organizing this event. It's been something that I mean, we've all been uh, looking forward to uh, very excitedly uh, ever since the Niti AI strategy document was uh, released. Uh, this has been in the works. I think it would have happened uh, six months ago or more except for COVID. And now I'm really glad and I'm very impressed uh, that you know the ministries have been able to pull it together even during this pandemic uh, with a, such a large participation from uh, global leaders in the various domains. Uh, congratulations and, and thank you so much for doing it. And of course, I want to thank uh, the ministries as well as the other organizers for giving me an opportunity to uh, be a keynote speaker in this session. And uh, frankly, you know, I'm a city boy, grew up in Chennai, moved to the US, studied and worked in cities. I cannot say I have any background in agriculture. so. Uh, it's not something that I can personally understand, but uh, being an AI scientist, and of course, you know, I've come back to India to set up and run the Vatvan Institute for Artificial Intelligence, which is really about bringing the power of AI uh, to social sector, uh, to, in fact, domains like agriculture and health in particular. And, and uh, you know, so I'm really privileged to be able to talk here. And in fact, I realize a number of the panelists uh, perhaps you know even more qualified than I am. So with all humility, let me at least set the stage for the very interesting discussion that will be following this. Uh, you know we all know that farming is a very very important sector. 
there are roughly 100 million families in India that are uh, farmers. And of course, you know, that means the numbers can be four or 500 million in terms of population size. Uh, but most of these farmers are uh, small farm holders. In other words, they are typically less than one to two hectares or two to four hectares. And this particular situation is not uncommon to India. In fact, worldwide, what you find is that in developing countries, the farms are smaller. Yet, the importance of farming sector in India and other developing countries is very clear. Over 49% uh, of our employment actually goes towards agricultural employment. Uh, although it only accounts for 16% of GDP, which right away points out the problem that in fact, we have a lot of people working in this domain, but you know perhaps not making as much of a living and contributing to the economy. And we do need to find ways to improve uh, the efficiency and productivity as well as the financial you know, success of this dom very, very core domain. With 49% of uh, our employ employable people working in the sector, it's clearly uh, not, not something that we can, we can ignore. And uh, you know, agriculture has been a domain which has been really uh, been a source of a lot of distress for lives. And you all, I'm sure, are familiar with farmer suicides and a bunch of other problems that persist. So we are really, in some sense, at a moment of crisis on, on how we can make this sector work and improve. Now, interestingly, you know, this is a thing I got from the ILO website. You can see the greener the uh, color is, the more of, a, of the population or employable population that's employed in agriculture. And not surprisingly, uh, developing countries or low and middle income countries are the ones where you find the, the, you know, the largest percentages. Within those countries, India is uh, somewhat in the middle, but overall, you know, India is clearly one of the countries that agriculture becomes a very, very important sector in terms of people's employment and feed. And right away, this points to another problem, which is uh, given that these are low and middle income countries and, and uh, not developed technologically or advancedly developed countries, the farm sizes will be small like in India. So the particular aspect that we are looking at small farms uh, that have to be supported is not unique to India and it actually spreads to the entire developing world. And therefore, you know, whatever we uh, do in India to solve this problem will be relevant for the rest of the world as well. It's not going to be only for India. Uh, plight of farmers is well known. They live in extreme poverty. Farmer suicides really are predominantly among small and uh, medium level for farmers. And about 25, 22% of farmers live below the poverty line. And in fact, as you'll see in a moment, that many of that uh, many of them really rely on other sources of income uh, for their own subsistence. So farming alone is not sufficient to pay. And the situation is not that different in other developing countries. You know, for example, as shown in the graph up there. Now, uh, you know, just thinking about what does what does a farmer do? What goes on in the life of a farmer? Uh, and right away, one of the things you notice is that uh, you know there are num varying statistics, but approximately people would agree 40, 40, 45% of farmer's income is actually from farm activities. Whereas more than that share, about 50 to 60% of the income is through other activities, non-farm activities. They may go to labor work somewhere or actually use their equipment to rent it out, do job, salary jobs in restaurants and do other side businesses as well. So in some sense, you know, the farmer in fact, not even able to fully employ themselves uh, on their key means of livelihood. Yet farming is their mainstay in the sense that that's where they have some control, where they have some freedom, and where they're able to decide what they do, as opposed to be at, at, as opposed to being at the mercy of others and other sources of employment. Uh, broadly speaking, you know, the first part of their work is really about planning and management, and and raising the right kind of finances and being able to obviously get loans and such, and uh, you know, uh, get equipment and so forth. Uh, really, is the first part of their work. And then, of course, it comes to cultivation, preparing the land, sowing the seeds, managing the water, uh, and you know, handling the soil health and issues related to that, managing the pest, uh, controlling the pest, and then finally harvesting. And equally, on the right side, there is storage, uh, selling, and distribution. And that's an important part. I mean, uh, even though it comes in the end, it, you have to be prepared for it. And as there's been a lot of discussion recently, this is an area that remains challenged. Farmers don't always get the right type of value uh, for their um, you know, products. Uh, there's clearly a supply and demand challenge, yet farmers need to make an income. There is a separate thread, which in this uh, you know, session we won't cover, 
which is quite a number of farmers are equally involved in livestock cultivation. Uh, that is another source of income, but that's not the topic of the current session. So I won't really uh, go into that very much. Now, if you look at, you know, what, what are the main uh, places where uh, there are weaknesses that could be addressed? So for example, I think, you know, there is quite a lot of room in all the aspects of farmers' lives where we can improve the situation in order to raise their income. And this is a research done by one of our team members across you know, variety of sources. And of course, these numbers are not very hard coded, but approximately you'll get the idea that uh, you know, crop selection is a place you know, where there is a lot of confusion and being able to do the right thing given, you know, given the land situation or the climate or the current uh, you know, whatever weather conditions for the upcoming season. Uh, a lot of problem with respect to uh, credit management and interest payments and so forth. Water turns out to be a very big issue, uh, being able to handle water properly uh, and being able to uh, you know, more efficiently manage it can actually be a source of a big income. So it goes on. And pest management is one where we can have you know, quite a bit of increase in uh, farmers' income. So across the board, what you see is that there are challenges in every aspect of farmers' uh, workflow and every aspect of it uh, could benefit by advanced methods to help the farmer. So ironically, you know, countries that are bigger, which are technologically more advanced, tend to have larger farmers. So they actually are able to manage these things much better. Countries like India, where we have a large farming populations and the farms tend to be small, is where the technology is needed, yet there is a gap in how that is being done, or how that can be done. Now, there has been, of course, a goal to double farmers' income, uh, you know, very well-known call from the prime minister six year, four years ago. And in fact, one of the things that the country has realized is to, rather than thinking about what we might call food security, which was what the country has been historically uh, focused on. And many of you might be quite young, but you know, when I was born and grew up, India was really dealing with a lot of food shortages and famines. And thanks to the green revolution, those issues were resolved. However, in, in turn, farmers income security has consistent and continued to be a big challenge and perhaps even gotten worse. So in today we have when we are thinking about farming, we're no longer thinking about you know, supplying as much food as is needed to the country, but in fact to make sure that the farmers' lives are, are successful. And there have been a lot of studies on where technology could be applied. I'm just pulling up something that I saw on a McKinsey report. And you can see, you know, on all aspects, various kinds of technology methods can be used. And this is not AI specific. So I won't uh, go into that as much, but uh, just, just broadly speaking, right, in terms of dispersal of loans or credit, whatever, insurance payments, uh, there have been a lot of talk about uh, precision uh, farming methods, which are really, really good. However, the technology that uh, currently that may be available may not always reduce to the small, small but under small farmers' ability to leverage, uh, you know, such highly advanced technical methods is also limited. And so while these techniques actually are potentially of value, we don't have means of making them available to the farmers who are greatest in need. Uh, things like you know, information and advisory with respect to weather and so on, or opportunities and places where there is some tech already. Agriculture extension programs tend to be you know, somewhat weak, and uh, there is all opportunity for communication, workflow management, et cetera, in the context of uh, extension work. On the other side, of course, in the price discovery, market dynamics, and so on, there are natural fintech opportunities and can we actually do some predictions with respect to uh, you know, uh, what the market is going to be, uh, yield forecasts and such. Uh, there is another source here that I'm uh, quoting from ICRISAT, which is of course in all of you know about it. And, uh, and, uh, and there, uh, you know, there is an there's a, there's a, you know, attempt to see if we can converge the variety of digital technologies that exist. Obviously analytics uh, can be used, uh, you know, various types of informatics to provide information about seeds and other breeding such things. Can we actually bring uh, you know, farmer specific information with IoT techniques, uh, maybe use drones and other methods for actually trying to do surveillance and being able to monitor, manage land and uh, using ultimately mobile devices as a way of doing the communication. It's a very, very uh, you know, elegant and compelling vision. Uh, however, I, I'll point out uh, you know, again, that the realization of this has continues to be a challenge, but this is kind of where we would like to get to. 
Now I'm going to uh, uh, you know look at quickly when you look at a survey of what happens to uh, currently the use of information and communication technology. I'm not talking about AI, although some of it is AI. In agriculture, you can broadly divide it into three segments: advisory and communication. Uh, there are national uh, portals for uh, communicating with the farmers, but they all you know uh, deal with uh, very significant challenges. There are a bunch of startups. I'm not going to name all of them, but just to throwing in a couple of names, for example, and there are a few in this panel that I'm sure you will hear about that are trying to provide various types of farmer advisories directly to the farmer and such. Insurance uh, and financing is another uh, big area and it's a critical challenge. Farmer uh, producer cooperatives and organizations have been trying to help farmers manage this, uh, but the potential use of technology there limited at least however that may be a particular means by which a technology can be uh, provided and ingested uh, there are very few private sector initiatives i understand skymet has something but not a lot of people in the insurance and financing world uh, supply chain is of course another big area it's very much a topic of uh, discussion and with the new form bill there are some changes there but private sector primarily is concerned about equipment supply naturally that's what you would expect and on the demand side big purchases can actually help uh, in terms of uh, using technology for market access. But the real summary of this is though, is that ad, whatever efforts that there are, uh, they are very ad hoc. They are not, uh, uh, you know, in a system level, there is no system level thinking. They tend to be very unsynchronized and uncoordinated. Uh, naturally for, you know, startups and companies, it's an opportunity driven uh, situation, but that does not uh, unfortunately solve the system level problems. And there's no sense of an ecosystem. Now I'm going to switch a little bit to talk about some of the explorations that we have been doing at Badwani AI. In fact, you know, partly to explain why I'm even talking about it. Uh, we took a landscape view of a lot of these things and identified one problem, which we are currently working on, pest and disease management. And we are now exploring and analyzing whether water management could be another problem where we may want to get into, although we have not really either started on it or made a decision yet to do that. So let me very quickly talk about what we are doing. Uh, we are specifically focused on uh, increasing the throughput of cotton. Cotton is a very important crop uh, for India, and India is the biggest cotton producing country in the world. And India's cotton productivity is still not as high as it can be. Uh, so we have realized, you know, pest control, pest management may be a place where we could uh, contribute. Uh, we've been uh, working with a bunch of variety of uh, extension programs, as well as private foundations such as Wellspun uh, and Deshpande Foundation to see if we can uh, provide uh, an AI-based approach to pest counting and appropriate use of pests. So pest losses are very high. Uh, different, uh, you know, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, crops have different amount. Cotton tends to, the losses tend to be between 30 to 40% recently. But uh, sometimes pests don't show, so you know it's not very systematic. Pest losses have reduced it, but that has often been because overuse of pesticides or it has other problems with this with the soil health as well as the product that is being made and so forth quite a lot of pesticides pesticide poisoning so a controlled approach to using pest uh, pesticides is obviously very important and uh, you know can we do that what we have looked at is that uh, you know currently the way this is done is pest are counted uh, through uh, captured on pest traps pheromone traps as well as sticky traps and they were counted and manually counted and entered into an IT system, which are then reviewed by uh, experts roughly once every two weeks. And then they would issue an advisory. Unfortunately, the data collection process, uh, synthesize it and so on, tend to be very messy and noisy. Uh, the, uh, they cannot actually issue an advisory for a single village. It tends to happen at a block level, 100 villages, and, and it's not very timely. So we realized that we may be able to develop an AI where a snapshot of the pest trap uh, will help us, uh, you know, count the number of pests through an AI, and then, you know, with the expert help, we can set some rules on uh, pest infestation magnitude and uh, issue an advisory relative to that on when pesticide should be used. So this is something that we have been actively working on. Currently, uh, being uh, piloted in uh, several different states: uh, Maharashtra, Telangana. Last summer, we did some work in Karnataka, Gujarat, and other places. And, uh, uh, you know, I think my colleague Raghu might say a bit more about this as well, so I won't go too much into it. Water management is another one that we are looking at. And part of the reasons to do that is, as you saw in my earlier slide, uh, 40, we, this is a place where there is a significant potential for significant savings uh, and therefore increase in income effectively. Uh, all three aspects of water uh, are in, you know, in challenge, water access, 
efficient use of water and water replenishment. Uh, these are just some numbers to realize that in India, more than the majority of farmers rely on rainfall. Uh, you know, irrigation is not that common everywhere and droughts are plenty. And uh, fresh water is widely used for, uh, you know, agri worldwide. Uh, so water access will remain a problem. And we know that water is going to be the biggest challenge of the 21st century. And agriculture is a very important domain. Uh, that's a big consumer of water, yet we need to do so. But so we need to do it in a way that water is available to everyone and we need to do it efficient. Uh, and then of course, you know, can we find a way to replenish the water that is lost? Now, can AI and technology help? Uh, we think so. Uh, for example, some of the help can be with respect to uh, farmers directly, such as, uh, you know, doing better, be be better rainfall prediction, uh, some of, you know, or for that matter to do uh, soil mixture and texture deduction in order to know how much water to really use, not over, over irrigate or not overuse the water. Um, and uh, some of them may be at the policy level, right? Can we actually set policies based on wide area surveillance using drones and satellite data? Uh, can we predict aquifer volumes? Uh, and then, you know, how that can be managed across, you know, across a state or a larger, larger portion of the states as well and so forth. So there is clearly some opportunities to do that. We have not quite gotten into it, but it would take not only a level at an individual, but a systemic approach because many of this don't affect an individual farmer. They affect an entire village or maybe, you know, a block and beyond actually. Now, all of that said, you know, there are fundamental challenges, right? Which is, uh, you know, in order for us to do all of this, uh, you know, bring uh, the power of artificial intelligence, uh, some of the pre-givens, in other words, some of the things that any AI solution would need is actually data. And collecting data in a robust and reliable way in the agriculture domain remains a big challenge. Data is not sufficiently collected, it's inaccurate, and it's siloed in multiple different places, and they are not consistent or coherent, meaning that they don't have similar formats or anything like that, and often they cannot even be discovered. Uh, so that problem is something that will have to be solved at a systematic level. There is no common tech platforms. As I said, there are many, many small players uh, that are doing very good work on their own, but there is no approach to synthesize a common AI platform uh, that will be leveraged by other people. There's no such thing as a tech uh, ecosystem. There is a lot of fragmented player, fragmented ecosystem with a lot of players. There are many startups who are still at the early stage, and there are very few big players that can provide a kind of gravity to bring some kind of convergence. Extension programs are notoriously weak, and the market approach also tend to be extremely localized, distributed, and fragmented, even, even within a state and so forth, right? And knowledge sharing is fundamentally you know, very ad hoc. Although there is a significant increase in cell phones, uh, it's not really fully utilized for a lot of the education that may be done. You know, some of the ways to think about it, you know, we have been very successful creating national strategy and national vision document. And in health, we've actually created a national digital health blueprint. I think we should be looking at creating an agriculture blueprint because that will certainly be relevant, not only for any particular state, but for an overall country level. Niti Aayog engaged in creating an agri stack. That work needs to be continued and create more such stacks that can be shared with a lot of the uh, players that a lot of the startups and others that are likely to come and work in the space. Uh, farming ultimately remains a state subject because a lot of variation across states and states need to form hubs that where they can coordinate the multiple different players as well as the farm cooperatives and others. And you know, also use the tech to you know, uh, increase the strength of the extension program. I mean, can we achieve convergence? Can we bring all of these different things you know, to provide a transformation using digital uh, technique, uh, you know, can we actually find a way to create a single uh, combined set of sources of information uh, to feed across these things and, and then they leverage from mutually, uh, mutually sharing information across these do domains aspect, finance to forecast to small holdings, uh, to access to materials and so on. That would be a dream. Uh, one of the things we have found, you know, broadly speaking, this is not only true of agriculture, but true of any social sector, is R&D and deployment is fundamentally a closed loop process. We may start with some use case, create some data sets, do some proof of concept, and develop some solutions and pilots. You have to iterate on it and, and, and scale. What's unique is that uh, in social sector, and this is very much true in agriculture, the capacity to do the technology side of the work, the tech POCs, working with the data, creating the solution, 
live with a lot of technology companies, startups, big, com big tech companies, and so on. Uh, whereas the implementation extension programs, uh, you know, uh, working with farmers remains with the government's domain experts. And these two tend to not overlap in their capabilities and their expertise and so on. Uh, we, one of the reasons I put the question mark is that one of the reasons we exist at Vadwani AI is really to play this role wherever we can, but we don't have to be the only ones. Actually, this is something where a government or a state organization can convene and help and players like us would be very, very happy to come and share our expertise and, and help. Uh, with that, I finished my talk. Thank you again. I hope this is uh, hopefully leads into a very good uh, conversation among the panelists themselves. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Anandan. Uh, actually, it was indeed a very wonderful presentation, complete analysis of issues in the agriculture sector, and then providing an approach for how technology can help solving these issues. This has set a very good tone for the session. And uh, maybe um, from government side, uh, uh, you have already covered what are the initiatives and some more is going on. And uh, uh, we are also working towards that blueprint for agriculture. I'm part of that team as well. Uh, thanks for setting the tone for session. Next, we have uh, Shri uh, Raghu Dharmaraju, Vice President of Products and Program Badwani Institute for AI. Uh, he is the moderator for the session. Uh, Mr. Raghu, for over two decades, he has been bridged between technology and social impact. He has developed, launched, and scaled social impact innovations in agriculture artificial intelligence, medical technologies, energy and transportation in Fortune 500 companies, startups, government and non-profits. Uh, over to you, Mr. Raghu. Then we have a panelist with him, Dr. Parveen Rao, Vice Chancellor of Professor Jay Shankar, Telangana State Agriculture University. Dr. R. Shekant, Scientist Digital Agriculture at Degreeset. Mr. Devashi then, uh, Principal Data Science Manager, Microsoft. Mr. Ranveer Chandra, Chief Scientist of Microsoft Azure Global. Ms. Kanchan Bonde, Product Strategy Head for Makers Lab, Tech Mahindra. Mr. Himanshu Goyal, Associate Director, Business Leader for the Weather Company, uh, IBM, India IBM. Over to you, Mr. Raghu, uh, for conducting the session. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, ma'am, and uh, thank you, Dr. Anandan, for setting up um, actually the landscape of the challenges this panel act has to grapple with. Uh, it's not an easy landscape. Um, even as we named our panel the AI uh, Agri Supply Chain, there was broad agreement across all panelists that really what we need to worry about most are the farmers, the farmers who are at the heart of what we call the Agri Supply Chain. And without improving their, their well-being, uh, it just means we are ignoring the same challenges that we haven't quite solved yet for the last 70 years. Um, and with the goal of doubling farmers' income, um, it behooves all of us to really think about how this wave of technology uh, can finally deliver on the promise uh, to the 50% of uh, people out there who still depend on agriculture as their prim primary um, income, right? And it's really important to reflect on this because depending on who you speak with, you'll hear that we are 20 years into the digital revolution or 30 years into the digital revolution. But we know that for the most part, the adop adoption of technology um, into large-scale agri programs and for the benefit of smallholder farmers has still been quite, um, what should I say? It still leaves a lot to be desired, right? Uh, we have done this in silos, in fits and starts. And AI provides an amazing opportunity uh, to take a comprehensive look of landscape of challenges and see how we can actually bring AI, uh, which is technology of today, as well as technology perhaps of the future uh, for the next, uh, couple of decades at least, it's seen as a key driver of advances, right? Um, so with that, what I would like to do today is uh, first start with an understanding of our landscape of challenges, a little bit more uh, from uh, Dr. Praveen Rao, 
and then we'll go to other panelists uh, talking about some specific solutions in AI that they are already building. We'll actually try to uh, demonstrate a couple of them. And then we'll move on to other panelists to uh, give us more of the platform view because it's not just individual solutions, but you need multiple types of solutions. And for that, you also need platforms and you need data, uh, obviously at the heart of all these platforms. So that's the story we would like to weave and before we go into the panel discussion. Uh, with that, let me actually first introduce uh, our uh, first speaker, uh, Dr. Praveen Rao. Um, thank you, sir, for joining us. Um, he is the Vice Chancellor of Professor Jayashankar Telangana, Agriculture, uh, Telangana State Agriculture University. He's been selected for the seventh uh, and uh, urbanization is taking in a big way. Uh, another one is uh, nutrition sensitive uh, diets are being sought after. Food waste is also another big opportunity what we have for AI. Then uh, declining resources and uh, as rightly pointed out by the earlier speaker, water is a very, very important component wherein I am swimming for the last uh, 35 years or so. Uh, say what you call abroad and here and in many countries. Uh, actually, the question is uh, how much to apply, when to apply, how best to apply. We haven't mastered them yet at the field level. This is an issue which we need to uh, look at. So the, basically, we are in a very, very uh, so what you call important stage uh, at this point of time globally and as well as at the country level. Uh, and uh, the population we have to cater to at the global level is around 9.7 as per the normal estimates, uh, business as usual estimates, and at the country level is 1.7 billion. I think we are in for a big uh, vertical. And uh, apart from this, we also notice that yield levels are low as compared to Asian peers or other countries. That is another uh, aspect which we have to look at next. Now, what we noticed is now uh, at the in the farmers uh, field level, you have these are the major issues. Say whenever we go to a farmer, he normally takes a decision for any crop or new technology based upon three factors. One is the say what you call uh, production cost. Then uh, number two is profits, and number three is risk. Nothing more, nothing less. His decision is based upon these three factors, because I also hail from a farmer's family uh, doing agriculture for the last, uh, say what you call several decades, my forefathers, grandfather, father, and myself, and so on and so forth. Now, when we ask the farmers, these are the issues what we have today. Is there is a low efficiency in production system, rare production costs are rising, whatever may be the reason, uh, inputs uh, low efficiency or uh, rising the prices of the inputs. And there is another important point is even though productivity is high, there is a low realization for say, from sales at, uh, at, the, um, at the market level. So there is a basically a disconnect. There is a poor agriculture supply chain stakeholders linkages, particularly at the uh, say food processing level. This is another aspect. Then uh, the national policy level issues. Uh, and um, we are now talking of that is the reason why sustainable agricultural intensification. Then food safety and nutritional aspects is another aspect uh, which we are looking at next. Then sensitivity to weather mark. Now, when we look at this uh, uh, ecosystem, now we have, for whom we have to develop this technology. So we try to uh, segregate them into five groups. One is for the farmers, then consumers, environment, policy makers, and opportunities for there is one more segment which we have intentionally not added, that is the research component, which there is a lot of clarity to be uh, sought. So I have intentionally didn't put that. And these are the uh, what call issues which we have to solve at the field level uh, and which we will, since the time is very short, I thought that I will flag them next. And now, uh, when we were doing this project, we have uh, mapped that what actually we need at the field level. Say, so pre sowing level, the farmer demands the input side. It is a predictive one. Then, prediction of sowing window, in other words, we can say that sowing intelligence, sowing progression for the policymakers, area estimation, variety. So now we are uh, so we are uh, trying to we have mapped all these, and from this, at least eight to ten. 
uh, issues we are now uh, addressing at the field level in cotton crop and as well as the rice crop even we are going for the varietal identification and we are trying to uh, introduce iot components which basically kanchan will speak who is she is also part of the project and uh, then uh, we also have uh, unmanned aerial vehicles that is drones we are uh, putting into service uh, so all these things we are talking of crop health monitoring in terms of uh, uh, diseases pests and the uh, water so all these components we are trying to address at the field level in two crops and followed by another two crops next now from this we notice that from our uh, uh, so what we call uh, this experience we notice that uh, data has rightly pointed out data 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 if we have this is a major issue in terms of availability ownership and quality now we are targeting this issue at the state level we are trying to develop a telangana agriculture data stacks for uh, this one as uh, so what we call anandan garu has pointed out national level data stacks so how we can uh, combine then then sustainable integration of uh, these data sources this is an issue this is a big issue because uh, say what you call interoperability standards and formats so how you can because data is heterogeneous or uh, say what you call it is in different formats machine sourced the, the process based then human sourced so you have large lot of data spatial data we have then temporal data we have so all these things so openness of platforms is another uh, challenge which we are seeing and affordable field models this is unless we bring in value proposition to the farmers i am afraid that these technologies will not be able to see the light of the day then the say what you call with regards to the message the 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 thing is that build open data stacks sustainable integration of data resources interoperability standards and formats which we are now working on it regulatory issues we have openness of platforms is an issue developing suitable affordable field implementable business models having value proposition to farmers and the stakeholders is the say what you call uh, approach which we have to look at and uh, uh, in this regard we are launching now about 12 uh, initiatives use cases at the farmers level we are not doing anything at the uh, research uh, institute level we are straight away taking them to the farmers fields about we are on automation on uh, say what you call ais on uh, say what you call analytics all these uh, about 12 use cases we are taking it to the farmers fields and we hope that in the next two seasons we'll be able to come out with some meaningful uh, user cases platforms which we want to implement in a hub and spokes model uh, which one one of which which we are uh, trying to do this season in the rabi season uh, in groundnut uh, on uh, we are using iot and uh, for irrigation technologies so this is what i want to uh, say what call uh, may present to the audience of today thank you very much thank you giving me for this opportunity thank you Th thank you dr pravin rao uh, for that uh, very informative overview of the various opportunities uh, that exist um, and, and of course opportunities exist because there are many challenges to solve uh, so what i what i wanted to uh, do next was actually um, probably walk the audience through a couple of specific ai based solutions because we keep talking about ai based solutions what does this mean what do these look like right um, but before i uh, get started i will actually start with a small demo uh, that uh, of the solution that anandan earlier mentioned but before we start just as a matter of housekeeping uh, please park your questions in the chat window here uh, we'll come back to it later on uh, in the session uh, as we start with our discussion segment we we'll look at these questions and start with the discussion so please do add questions um, and sorry that it's a little disruptive to take questions speaker by speaker that's the reason we and chances are we are going to see themes emerge across uh, various um, you know uh, presentations that come up so we thought it's best if we take questions at the end yeah so with that let me actually uh, start with a um, very short uh, presentation or a demo um i hope everyone can see the screen uh, can someone just confirm no not yet okay just a second please yeah.
Yes. Are you able to see it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So earlier Anand mentioned um, specifically about cotton, about 30 million people in India, that's farmers and their families depend on cotton. Uh, and in the and this is a framework that's come up by really agriculture specialists, not us. There's lots of avoidable pest losses, uh, especially in cotton. And this was very high in 2017-18 when parts of Maharashtra, parts of Telangana, uh, Madhya Pradesh, etc., lost as much as 50% of the crop. So this is sort of an adverse event that when it happens has a very high impact uh, on livelihoods of farmers. And this is especially ironic because majority of pesticides, as been already mentioned, uh, used in India already go into cotton, right? Uh, now these farmers are not direct technology users themselves. Yes, this is changing, but for many years to come, uh, chances are uh, they will continue to depend on large scale agriculture programs, such as the field staff, especially, to understand what they need to do on a day-to-day -day basis and also react to especially bad uh, sort of uh, situations, such as a major pest infestation. The challenge, of course, is that today the farmers and uh, field staff or lead farmers may be using certain apps that the state or other uh, nonprofit programs have um, deployed, but the fundamental data that comes in is manual in nature. Uh, and there are issues with just motivation to accuracy because of skills, time, etc. And when you have unverifiable, inaccurate data, the experts sitting at the universities or in the programs can do only so much, right? And they end up giving aggregate advice, not a fine grained or granular advice. It ends up being inaccurate because data itself is unverifiable. And of course, there's delay for a couple of days to uh, a week's time. So we worked and none of these things can be solved in silos at all. And we worked closely with state governments of Maharashtra and Telangana, Better Caught Initiative, uh, programs such as Wellspun, Deshpande Foundation, and agri uh, research folks. So all these folks have to come together to solve these problems, to really go from problem to solution to deployment. Uh, I will not repeat. Here's a quick demo. So even though currently this is being shown in English, it is actually deployed in the local language, uh, as you can imagine. And it is in the hands of uh, the extension workers and the lead farmers to begin with, to be used in demo plots. Uh, and there is instant advice. And as you see, there is human in the loop to actually seek advice from the program. Currently getting piloted uh, in three states. Uh, we started on this roughly 18 months ago. And of course, the plan is to take it to all farmers and bring in other uh, data, etc., to actually make this not just about timely detection and uh, alerts, but also see if we can get into prediction. And ultimately, it's about increasing crop yields and uh, livelihoods. And as you can see, uh, while you get specific data from a specific farm that can come together to provide this dashboard view for programs. And this is also something we've deployed as part of the pilots. And this gives the programs a bird's eye view of what is happening in various areas that they cover. So that even farms that do not actually have the traps can also receive advice or at least the alert, right? And that to in a granular way. And actually this sets us up pretty well to really talk about the potential is that of large scale transformation of these agriculture programs. Uh, in a way, while bringing accurate on the ground data, uh, you actually have sustained scaled impact at the program level. Right? Uh, and it's not only about AI, we need to build products, integrate them into systems as comprehensive solutions. With that, let me actually invite uh, Dr. Uh, Srikanth Rupavataram, uh, who is with ICRISAT, as well as uh, Plantix uh, to share some of his work. I'll stop my screen and also uh, introduce, stop, uh, introduce him just a second. So Dr. Srikanth Rupavataram is a scientist under the digital agriculture theme 
um, in the innovation system of Drylands program of ECRISAT. Uh, he holds a PhD in post-harvest technologies from Massey University, New Zealand, and a master's in the same field from University of Essex, UK. Uh, he has worked in diverse cultural backgrounds in UK, Africa, and Oceania. Uh, he's a Marshall Papworth Scholar and also a recipient of the prestigious Gardner's Prize. Uh, he uh, currently uh, is working with Plantix and Icrisat, um, and he mentors ag tech companies in the iHub Icrisat, handling projects that use artificial intelligence, capacity building of farmer producer organizations, and developing digital tools for extension management. And I thought uh, uh, Srikant's presentation could be a good bridge going from a very specific solution that I shared to how they are now bringing data from the ground to provide even country level surveillance. So over to you, Srikant. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Raghu. And uh, can I see my presentation, yes, please? I, I will bring it up. Just give me a second. I can do it from my side too. Okay, you're able to see this, correct? Yeah? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so over to you. Yeah, uh, this is my starting slide. It's, it's empowerment of smallholder farmers in India. So I will talk to you about the genesis of what happened for the last four years in a, uh, in a project that I was dealing. And uh, it started uh, in 2016 uh, when Icrisat was sought for help from uh, a German-based startup, Plantix. And uh, they had a, a POC for detecting uh, diseases. And uh, the objective was to customize the application for Indian situation, that is for our crops. And for the needs of our farmers. So this, this objective was realized not just by ICRISAT alone, but with the partnerships of various organizations. And I want to mention uh, Dr. Uh, um, uh, the Telangana State Agriculture University, Professor Jay Shankar uh, Telangana State Agriculture University, Government of Andhra Pradesh, Indian Council of Agriculture Research Institutions in uh, Hyderabad, and also uh, some based in other locations, and uh, Acharya Njiranga Agriculture University. Next, please. Uh, from this journey, uh, while I will uh, also talk to you about Plantix focusing on detecting pest and diseases or nutrient deficiencies at the farmer level, uh, the work recently, uh, they started uh, uh, looking at how we can fill the bridge when there is a detection done and when there is a need identified from, by the farmer for the solution, how can they source the product which is the right one from the nearest retailer and the, and, and the product details. So this is now going to encompass not just the user, the end user farmer, but the other players in the supply chain. So in this ecosystem, the work has now started to encompass all the other players also, other stakeholders. Next, please. So what does Plantix do? If you can see the difference between the two images that are above, there is something wrong with the one on, on the left-hand side or the right-hand side of your screen. Um, if your eyes can detect this, we are enabling a software which uses machine learning and deep neural networks to do the same detection in one or two seconds time. Next, please. So Plantix, this is a simple application that not only does image recognition, it also gives disease alerts by uh, taking care of the user. If you are a tomato grower or a rice grower, it will, it will scan the six, 50 kilometers radial distance and see how many people were affected by any of the uh, problems like a disease or a pest and notify the user saying, hey, this disease is very prevalent in your crop. So that early detection notification, even for a healthy farm is actually given to the user and it is very targeted extension. Then it comes to even uh, giving details on management practices, cultural practices and the chemicals uh, it is also possible for people and the user to actually ask questions. There's an online community where they can post their picture or image or their problem. 
and you we will see so many answers coming from not only experts but also fellow farmers so it's a very learning community that is already there about 20 to 25000 messages in various indian languages we see every day in this online community itself then we realized that the importance of a crop advisory right from the sowing date to the harvest time is most critical to even avoid a disease or a pest they can do certain practices in a scientific way that will benefit the user or the farmer so now uh, there is a crop advisory that takes care of that and of course a disease library with lot of details everything even in an offline mode any user can use it next please uh thankfully this was uh, having lot of favor also from the governments and uh, we could launch it in 2017 in may uh, if you see the left side uh, the erstwhile uh, chief minister of andhra pradesh and then uh, last uh, 2018 in the kisan unnati mela there was an opportunity to demonstrate this application to the honorable prime minister of india next speaks if you come to the users worldwide about 74% of them are from india and represent india the monthly active users if we see and about 8% uh, from bangladesh 7% from pakistan and other countries uh, including uh, brazil egypt tunisia jordan so india this is highly rated and used by the users within india uh, next please the performance so around 550 diseases can now be recognized easily so the training has been done to 550 types and uh, about 90% of accuracy among 300 diseases and pests and about 75% accuracy for the remainder 250 it covers about 35 crops it includes cereals uh, fruits vegetables um, oil seed crops legumes uh, most popular almost all the popular uh, fruit and vegetables are also included in the application detection process next please one of the most important aspect here i will talk to you about what is the data that we get from the field from an individual user is the time stamp and the location stamp when they send the image for processing now we have millions more than 25 million image data sets from around the world around 20 22 percent uh, 22 million of them from india alone now we know exactly from where the pest and the disease has occurred when we can identify that image or the disease now we also have the time stamp this is a luxury now for us because we know exactly for the last 4 years what is happening into the seasonal variability of these pest and disease attacks and we can also see district wise mandal wise village wise exactly what is the intensity of damage that is happening so this metadata actually we are still using it to predict what is going to come in the very near future when we are programming and modeling it with uh, weather and soil data next please uh this one you can see in the middle this is the latest kharif season data of fall army worm so we all know from 2018 onwards we had this uh, uh nuisance because of uh, fall army worm invasion especially in the Uh, maize growing areas it has spread to other crops so the real time disease alert is possible now there is a live tracker anyone can uh, put uh, plantix.net and or you can put in google uh, live tracker of fall army worm plantix you can get it and you can see that live actually online so the data is also available for research institutes for using it for modeling future uh, pest and disease uh, predictions work so uh this real time disease disease alert is possible because of the ai uh we we also do the programming enough to make us give a, a valuable prediction of a disease or a pest in the nearby area as i said earlier so that is right now uh the user experience actually the one of the left side screenshot is about that in the local telugu language next one please yes we are all aware uh the most important part of how ai can help small holder farmers is the vulnerability a farmer has when they have a need for a agrochemical when they go for a purchase uh instead of going to a doctor if people rely mostly on the pharmacists we face problems they want to sell products that are going to give them 
big margins and profits. The same thing happens to farmer when they reach out to the traders most of the time. So here is an opportunity using AI to give a decision, a choice for the farmer and give a voice for the poor, which was not available earlier because there are limitations of the agriculture extension system in India and not everyone can be reached because of the high numbers. So everybody has the same problem, but AI can help in detecting pests and diseases and also helping farmers get the right quantity and the quality of inputs. So this is one uh, uh, very, uh, I, I can say we were very, we stumbled on this innovation and we are so happy that we have made uh, AI work for India. And uh, I hope you can taste and see the goodness of this application by downloading in uh, Google Play Store. It is free freely available and uh, uh, you can see the results for yourself. It also has a WhatsApp number, which will be shared to everyone, um, where you can actually, it's a chatbot. You don't need, if you're an iOS person, you actually can use the same services to the WhatsApp chat number. So that uh, it's an Android app, but you also get its usability through a chatbot in a WhatsApp mode. Next, please. It's a small German startup team, but a uh, lot of achievements in the last four years, if you see uh, some of the innovation awards or the recognitions that it happened, it's because of catering to the needs of the farmer and also doing the sprints required to innovate the product. We don't have a completed product yet. I think it's going to change further based on the user feedback and the user interfaces that uh, experiences that the farmers have. So we all look forward for uh, greater penetration of AI through these uh, user uh, friendly applications like Plantix. And in Ikrisat, we have a uh, innovations hub where we also have projects that deal with AI and they are all in the proof of uh, concept, no, uh, concept stage. And we will be coming up with more such wonderful innovations in the future. And we are very open for collaborations. Ikrisat, you can reach us anytime to the website. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Srikant. That, that was that was great. Um, so next, uh, and I think you set this up very nicely uh, for us to actually transition to Dr. Devashish Dan, uh, who is the lead data scientist for Azure Farm Beans uh, at Microsoft. Uh, Dr. Devashish is principal data science manager at Microsoft India. He currently leads the Agri Food Machine Learning Group. Uh, in Azure Global Engineering. He has 20 years of experience in computational physics and machine learning in life sciences and agriculture domain. Prior to Microsoft, he has worked at DuPont Pioneer as Global Data Science Manager, where he and his group delivered many leads for hybrid development. So thank you, uh, Dr. Devasis, for joining us. Um, uh, it'd be great if you could sort of take it from here and give us a little bit of the platform view and also share some of the very interesting demos uh, that you have. So let me bring up your presentation. Just give me a second. Thank you, Rahul. While you kind of bring up the presentation, good afternoon, all of you. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure to contribute to this forums and thanks to the organizer for inviting us because there are multiple Microsoft folks who will be representing many AI applications and the AI platform that Microsoft is building for the greater society. So uh, agriculture, agri-supply chain, and other uh, adjacent industries are lifeline for India's growth, and more so, and more for um, the equitable prosperity of all. And probably the education comes then the most, another significant one other than agriculture, which can really help in equitable prosperity. So translating knowledge and technology developed globally and in other industry domains to enable agri-experts in our country, and of course, globally, is a mission for Microsoft. And Microsoft Ag Platform, agriculture platform on Microsoft Azure Cloud is a cornerstone in that particular mission. So welcome to uh, Azure Farm Bits. Next slide, please. So helping large section of Ag community uh, realize value from the promising AIML, uh, POCs, software, and other data-driven technologies that they develop, just either in a startup or in universities or even in ag enterprises, require significant amount of compute 
and software engineering strength, consistency, and resilience. So this undifferentiated heavy lifting of say compute, a specific agree stack, software engineering strength, consistency, and resilience is what Microsoft is uh, doing as a business case for agriculture because we see a lot of value and this is how we can enable the agri community. So welcome to Azure on, uh, uh, welcome to uh, Farm Beats on Azure Clouds. So our mission is to build a digital agriculture in specific solutions and enable people without the need to invest in deep engineering or AI ML resources. So when I say um, that we are doing the undifferentiated heavy lifting as you have heard in many other previous speakers uh, and as we'll probably will hear in some other uh, uh, later talks also, um, the building any AIML solutions which is specific for agriculture requires uh, accuring, aggregating and processing a large amount of agricultural data. And for developing one model or a suite of model uh, and especially in agriculture, one data source is not enough. You need data from drones and satellite, let's say for imaging, you need data from weather and you need data from soil at least to do any meaningful predictions in agriculture. So you need sensors, you need drones, you need weather, satellite and farm machinery data at scale and, and even historical data. So uh, farm bills will basically enable data storage, data aggregation, uh, and fetching data from multiple weather providers, whether it is free, uh, paid, third party, through APIs, as basically the farm bits evolve. So generating and maintaining AIML uh, derived secondary data like cloud removed images, I will show a few, a few demos and example, uh, and large scale soil moisture maps, et cetera, is also one of the uh, important things that Azure farm bits kind of will provide. So we will not only be the provider for primary data source, which we are not generating ourselves, but secondary data and process data, which is again a kind of heavy lifting that we are providing right now and we'll be providing in future also, and we will increase our repository. Again, as you go ahead in the journey of building these models, and especially when the data comes streaming from satellite and drone and farm machinery, and, we, and as we are seeing in some of the developed world, uh, since these are geospatial and temporal data, um, querying and reasoning through it and getting the right data for your modeling is an enormous task. So the moment you basically move from thousand farms to a million farms and to let's say 10 million acre, most of the classical systems and even the cloud systems can break down in the sense that it can take months to query and months to get the right data on your plate itself. We are enabling that. And on the top of that, uh, so basically we are, uh, and we are very mindful of the fact that we are very kind of important piece, but not alone in this world and cannot enable the agricultural system alone. So we need to build an ecosystem around us and around all these enterprises. So Microsoft build and third party AI ML agri models like crop type, phenotype, maturity, yield forecast, sustainability model like DNDCs, cover crop estimations, and kind of India focused uh, uh, um, and, are for, uh, and from startups will be enabled on the Azure marketplaces. So basically we address and we are addressing first party data, secondary data, large data to query through the data and basically availability of third party models. And in some cases, Microsoft first party models in the agree stack. Next slide please. So this is a kind of an overall view of the uh, how our platform looks like, right? And we'll be looking like, it will be a, a pass, a platform as a service. So this is kind of mostly for demonstration purpose and we are much more than this and will be more than that. So we are ingesting data from sensors. Uh, we are ingesting, our, um, allowing the customers ability to ingest data from drone, satellite and weather, even third party weather data through APIs. And all these things are available and will be available at the click of a button on Azure Cloud. Uh, and at the same time, we are enabling because just because we already have those resources, device management, IoT device management, data visualization, and sample AI ML models, the templates, so that basically customers can build on the top of that. So those will be open. Uh, some of them will be open uh, to the customers on Azure so that they can build on the top of that. And the entire ecosystem from precision farming to smart equipments and even to what we call connected cord, but kind of mostly livestock will be enabled through this. Next slide, please. 
So this is one example, uh, basically, where we are uh, showing uh, the value of data, a large amount of data, and also the challenges that one may face just from one data source and how Azure is basically enabling that. So this is a classic case, and as some of the previous speakers have mentioned, the water is, is going to be a big problem, and it is also a kind of problem, in, especially in areas where there are drought or indeed may face drought. So how we can do in a live monitoring? But more than that, it's a demonstration purpose to show the value of the Azure uh, ecosystem or the platform itself. So what we, are, what we are trying to focus over here is a soil moisture map so that you can get an estimate of volumetric soil moisture uh, at each and every, let's say, 20 meter, 10 meter, even five meter of your farm. And this basically uh, uh, uses both IoT sensors and as well as uh, satellite or the drone, uh, on the drone maps. And as you can understand, it is almost impossible for a small scale farmer to have a uh, sensor, densely packed sensor. So what we are trying to show over here is that how you can combine a minimal amount of sensors and satellites to give a volumetric soil map, which is way better because it captures the kind of uh, the complexity and variation within the field, which the classical EVI or NDWI satellite maps cannot capture. And, and to top that, we do understand that just having a soil moisture map is not going to solve the problem of farmers. So that's why we call it a secondary data, which is kind of available uh, on Azure uh, to the ag tech customers, to the enterprise, so that they now combine their knowledge, their problem statement, uh, like say they want to do uh, prescriptive irrigation, right? So here you have to combine weather for forecast, a uh, soil type to understand the soil potential because volumetric soil water will not going to help alone and then basically advise the farmers accordingly. So basically we are trying to help the journey of the enterprises and do the heavy lifting over here. Next slide, please. So before you start the uh, video, there's a video over here. Let me give you kind of a small uh, introduction over here. So this is another example of where Microsoft is using uh, the state of the art machine learning to basically crack some of the most common problems uh, that, uh, that we face. So when, uh, when I've mentioned that basically we are in the business of providing secondary data for phenotyping for soil moisture so that people can combine satellite data, IoT data and other stuff. One of the critical problems, even in, in, I mean, even in US and of course in India, we have the entire Karif season is you can't look through the clouds. Or for almost a month or maybe two months, you have dense clouds. So that's a showstopper, right? I can build a POC concept for a very clean images uh, and form a, for a very small um, uh, uh, span of time, but that may not be kind of applicable for my exact production scenarios. So Microsoft has kind of developed a, a deep learning base and basically it uses state-of-the-art GANs and series of GAN generative adversarial learning kind of approaches to use both the uh, cloud penetrating satellite information as well as reflectance uh, satellite information Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 to combine and basically clean out or remove the cloud from the images. So if you could run, run the video, I will just um, kind of explain it. Begu. So what you are seeing on the left-hand side of the panels are basically clouded scene. And once I apply my AIML technique, how are those clouds removing? And it's a kind of series of images uh, um, near Washington state. And uh, this is basically uh, is showing that our method, which will basically uh, make users, uh, the secondary data of Sentinel-2 after cloud removal available on Azure, and they can use this, um, uh, this deep learning methods or the applications of this deep learning methods in their, all their downstream applications. So as you can see on the left-hand side, there are, sometimes there are clouds and sometimes they're kind of clean image and sometimes they're haze. So this method is able to recapit recapitulate scenes pretty accurately. And you may have close to three weeks or four weeks, I think even a month of uh, clouds. So basically eight or 10 scenes missing, we can still reconstruct that. And this is really critical because if you have sudden changes in the landscape, that cannot be done through imputation of time series. You need to have this data penet or the cloud penetrating uh, scenes to really understand that. And I will stop here and I will take any questions later on. Thank you.
Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Devashish, for uh, sharing a couple of interesting use cases, but also uh, actually talking about uh, you know, the platform that actually needs to be built uh, to deliver on the promise of uh, AI. Uh, now I request uh, Ms. Kanchana Bonde uh, to actually talk about their work at uh, Tech Mahindra. But first, let me introduce her. Um, Ms. Uh, Ms. Kanchan Bonde, uh, my apologies, not Kanchana Bonde, Ms. Kanchan Bonde is the product strategy head for Makers Lab Innovation of Tech Mahindra. She has 21 years of rich hands on experience in large and complex service deliveries, as well as product management and product development. Uh, she's a global leader, uh, one of the thousand leaders of the thousand leaders program of Tech Mahindra Limited and one of the toppers uh, in the Certificate in Global Business Leadership course by Global Next University 2015. And what's really great about the work that uh, Kanchan and her team are doing is that uh, they are looking at challenges, not in specific points of the journey, but across the journey of the farmers in trying to build multiple solutions. So over to her to share what trying to do that looks like and why they are trying to do that. So, uh, Kanchan, uh, over to you. you. Uh, see this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, thanks a lot for that. And uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to be a part of this panel. Uh, so, basically, we at Tech Mahindra Makers Lab, which is the innovation address of Tech Mahindra, uh, Agritech for us is one of the major focus areas. And this whole inspiration is based on the plight of the farmers that we can see. Uh, Makers Lab basically uh, is an innovation center where we concentrate on a lot of different technologies, latest uh, cutting edge technologies like AI, quantum computing, et cetera. But at the same time, we have certain focus areas and Agritech is one of the important ones of them. Uh, so if you could move to the next slide, please. Uh, so Makers Lab is uh, spread across the world. We have 12 labs out of which four are in India and rest of them are across the world. And uh, in the agri-tech basically, uh, when we looked at this entire uh, area, we saw that there are a lot of things that are being done on the input side, uh, on the market side, there are uh, different solutions available. But if you look at the farmer really and try to speak to them, understand what the problems they are facing really, day-to-day -day problems. Uh, not too much of focus and attention we saw outside uh, our organization. So we saw that not many were focusing on them. And that is why we kind of built our vision and mission. And uh, we said that we will build solutions for the farmers, which are applicable, affordable, accessible, achievable, and of course, very importantly, sustainable. So as a part of this uh, journey, we have been on this journey for almost uh, six months now. And uh, we built a few things. So let's, uh, before we go there, let me just talk about uh, the, what has happened on the supply chain. So just sticking to the topic, what has been happening from 1960 chain? Uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. Yeah. So when uh, I think there was a, a discussion about 1960, that time when uh, food security was the main issue. And if we compare between 1960 to 2020, you can see that this uh, production has increased multifold and uh, which has resulted in a lot of surplus. Uh, so, and uh, the input side has adjusted, but if you look at what has happened to the farmer, the exit price at the farmer's level decreased because there's surplus of uh, supply. Whereas the demand, the reach of demand for that farmer is only to the local area. And so, um, the main issues that happen, one is that the supply chain, so uh, supply chain uh, has to be demand driven. So the, what we are trying to say here is that uh, at the moment, it is all a push kind of uh, demand and supply. So it's not that uh, the farmers are getting a lot of inputs about how much demand is going to be there. Accordingly, I'll make the production like you have in another industry. 
so it's all like push and then if there is surplus then they don't get enough money that is the main problem because of which farmers are facing a lot of challenges uh, secondly moving from production centric mindset to productivity centric mindset so we are on we have been only looking at uh, how much is the produce per hectare but uh, how much is the profit for that farmer how much value did the farmer get that mindset change needs to happen and of course increase uh, enabling the increase of reach of farmer producer and i'm sure the government has been working on this so many of our people are working uh, to get and address these issues so what is it that we have been trying to do in these uh, in the context of the supply chain and when i say the supply chain i'm looking at it end to end right from the input side where the farmer has has to buy the seeds the uh, fertilizers etc uh, to the production where the entire cycle of the farming happens and then the market and beyond so if we can do, the, uh, do go to the next one so we have tried to summarize how we are uh, addressing and i'll speak about each one of these so the first one and i think this has been the theme uh, even within our discussion about the crop selection that's a major thing uh, many times i mean if we look at the example of onions sometimes it goes beyond the level or the price it, it's like exorbitant sometimes they have to sell it at Four and eight rupees per kg. So that's that's very very uh, difficult because what is happening is that the farmers are not getting the crop selection information, uh, any uh, information which is related to the market demand, which is related to uh, the conditions of the farm. If we are able to give them a crop selection tool which is based on all of this artificial intelligence, based on the data of the market. not only the local and the uh, state of the country market but also the data from the export ma uh, market available as well as looking at the farm and what is it what is uh, the level of the uh, soil water which crops are possible so it's a complete uh, decision support system uh, and that is what we are trying to do we are early in this journey and as all of you have suggested yes data is a big problem but uh, i'm sure we'll get there with uh, with the support from uh, all of you and the government the second one is to change the mindset uh, productivity centric mindset rather than the production centric mindset and for that what we believe is that the core problem there is farmers are not looking at themselves as entrepreneurs they are still uh, i mean if you look at them they would not be focusing on what is their profit the whole mindset has been how much production can i get so how do we make that mindset change secondly the farmers are also proprietors most of the times and so their family income expense and the farm income expense that all gets interrelated so they never get a complete view of where they stand and that is why we built this app which is called darpan uh, darpan app helps the farmers to pick up uh, to enter the information about Uh, their expenses about their income uh, right even in their household or in the farm and not only the cash income and expenses but also in kind and it has a way of generating the year to date profit and loss statement for the farmer so if you could just play the video uh, for this app which you can see in between uh, no no just yeah so you can see uh, that the person gets an annual profit and loss and in fact this app also has uh, features about uh, managing the assets managing their loans which is also a very big problem and this also considers all the types of income so income coming from say the farmer has a son who is working as a salaried individual so for the family what is my profit and loss for the farm what is my profit and loss so when they start seeing all these things we believe that this mindset change becomes more and more possible because they are now able to see where do they stand and that's why the name of the app has been uh, has been decided as tarpan so this is an app which is now available from our side um, and addresses the problem of productivity centric mindset uh, then looking at the productivity improvement as such uh, we kind of try to look at very different kinds of problems that they face so one of the problem is the uh, many small animals or even wild animals that come into the farm and many times a very good harvest is spoiled because of that now as you all know the scarecrows of the past probably don't seem to work we are dealing with the uh, with life here which uh, tends to organically evolve as we evolve our uh, our strategies 
So what we are working on is an AI-based modern scarecrow. The concept here is that we can use vision-based AI to identify different types of animals which are coming in. And based on the type of animal, we could uh, uh, use uh, different types of scaring techniques to drive them away from the farm. So this is something which we are working on. We have completed the vision part of it, and we are now working on the uh, scaring and driving away part of this solution. Uh, the second uh, interesting uh, research project that we have undertaken is regarding integrated weather management. We call it Pi or Panchang intelligence. So as you all are, as you are all aware, uh, old Indian almanacs used to have lot of uh, predictions uh, for the rainfall, particularly. and india being driven so much uh, by rainfall the, uh, the agriculture so that becomes very very important feature and what we are trying to do here is what we have observed is if you look at satellite data and the predictions based on that if you look at uh, the iot information and very localized uh, maybe predictions that we can do on that and if you look at the panchang there are different aspects of weather management so the thought process here is can we not combine all of this and try to bring one weather channel which can actually give various uh, the, the combined uh, uh, wisdom of all of these technologies and give it together so here in the on the screen uh, you can see we have started comparing because this is a research project we are not claiming anything yet but we are comparing different uh, uh, inputs and where we went wrong where where the panchang went wrong where it was giving accurate results as compared to even the weather apis so you can see uh, that So this is something which is uh, again work in progress. We are calling it a research project because we are not decided on what is better than what. In the end, we may just end up integrating all of that. And the third one, I'll just uh, speak very very briefly about because we saw uh, some very nice uh, pest related uh, solutions already available. Uh, now what we are doing was a bit different because uh, sustainability is also one of the major focus areas and how do we reduce the use of pesticides. and uh, there have been a lot of uh, very successful strategies where pests are controlled using eco ecology itself so you have pest you bring in their predators and the predators control the pests so it becomes a very organic system of pest management but this is not known to many people and even identifying the pest uh, whether it is a harmful pest or a harmless pest or whether it's a friend even that people don't know so here again we are trying to use vision based ai to uh, for anyone to upload a photograph and we can identify what that image is and then give information about whether it's a friend or a foe and what are the different ways of handling it when to be alarmed and what kind of solution can be implemented by the farmer so this is like general very very high level overview of what solutions we have undertaken as a part of our research in the makers lab certainly these things we want to uh, make it into product and launch it as well like darpan uh, if you could move to the next screen please yeah so apart from that uh, we are also working with government bodies uh, as sir mentioned uh, we are working as a part of the economic world economic forum along with pjtsc eu government of telangana and the pilot uh, very very i'm very very hopeful uh, for the results of the pilot because it is very interesting uh, you saw the uh, use cases that uh, uh, sir had shown and those are very very useful i would just like to say one thing uh, which i prominently felt in this entire uh, project is that the willingness of government bodies the universities the startups to work together and really make that happen uh, that i have not seen in many places so i would like to really congratulate the team and i'm so happy to be a part of this group uh, the pilot uh, we are in the process as sir mentioned so i'll not get into details Uh, but a uh, lot of ai satellite information uh, wherever satellite information is not able or maybe not accurate or uh, even just to ratify also we are trying to use other technologies like drones like iot uh, localized information from farms so uh, very interesting project which is going on and the last one i wanted to point out is the work that we are doing with the principal scientific advisor to the government of india's office and here this is very interesting because this is something everyone has been saying that we don't get data from various departments together and uh, we here along with uh, uh, icst which is uh, another ngo and the principal scientific advisor's office uh, we have built this app uh, which is basically providing a lot of information so if you see here 
the weather forecast, weather information, uh, some advisories, land surface, crop details, soil health, and water surface and groundwater information. So this is all the information locked into different uh, ministries, which they have very kindly shared. And this is a platform that has been created, keeping the farmer in the mind. So this is a free app being provided to all the farmers. So this will be launched shortly. Uh, and uh, this is an app which is available in 12 uh, Indian languages, which is uh, going to have a lot of information which is useful and at the fingertips of the farm. So uh, with this, uh, basically, um, I would like to say that this is a very, very exciting area. Lot of challenges, but a lot of satisfaction that uh, we can make a very major difference to the life of uh, people who really matter. And uh, we are very, very happy to be a part of this uh, um, work as well as this forum. Thank you. Thank you, Raghu. Thank you, Kanchan, for that uh, presentation. And thanks for sharing the scope of your work. Uh, very exciting. Uh, and as we can all agree, uh, and as Kanchan actually sort of ended on the note of data, uh, that sets it up pretty well for uh, uh, presentation by uh, Himanshu Goel uh, of IBM. Let me first uh, pull up his presentation and also uh, introduce him. Um, Himanshu uh, Goel is the Associate Director, IBM, and Head of the Weather Company, India, uh, an IBM business. Uh, Himanshu, an entrepreneurial leader, has a track record of building and leading high-impact, high-performance organizations to lead in new markets and deliver growth. He has been a co-founder of two startups, delivered and led four product launches, and managed uh, one acquisition. So Himanshu, uh, let me just Thank give me second while I uh, bring up your uh, presentation. Thank you, Raghu. Really appreciate. I'm seriously excited to be a part of this August panel. And, you know, it's amazing that Indian government is doing such a wonderful job to raise awareness of AI. So let me start with this uh, basic, uh, you know, there's an ad we put out some time back talking about where is the farmer today, you know, with a lot of diesel, a lot of sweat, but now it's the time of a lot of data points to come in. And when we talk about artificial intelligence, without good quality, actionable data, artificial intelligence would be very artificial, as you would know. So it's, it's really a priority that how do you build the primary data resource? And when you're talking about agri supply chains, you're really talking about uh, planning the growth, as a lot of our August speakers talk about, and then managing the growth. and uh, you know, uh, the last speaker talked about productivity versus production. So, you know, there's a lot of lessons which are learned, which are not compiled well. And I would uh, make a statement here that a lot of the panelists who are deeply involved in building something around agriculture today do suffer from the fact that the dots are not connected. There are a lot of data available everywhere. I mean, India has proudly been uh, around the uh, you know green revolution we feed a million plus billion plus people we are biggest producers of a lot of things including milk uh, but where where are we not connecting the dots and i think there's a great effort including with this platform to build that so i'll request you to move to the next slide Raghu, please so when we talk about agtech uh, you know we are seeing Every aspect of AgTech involves weather insights. And it's important for us to really appreciate that the people involved in agri supply chains need weather insights at every stage. When we talk about logistics, no brainer for that. For trading, uh, you know, I had a student once in one of my MBA class who asked me, what would the weather be in Kenya? Because, and I was very curious. I said, why do you want to know that? He said, look, I'm a trader in Latur for Turdal you know, I would like to know what's the weather prevailing so that, you know, I, I, I have some business opportunity. Talking about the ag advisors, you can't do much without weather data. I mean, all great insights, uh, but needs weather data, which will decide whether the low cost will move to one direction from the other based on wind velocity and direction, or, uh, you know, a bright will occur in some of the seeds planted. And then a lot of the clients, you know, I mean, we are all humans, our tastes, needs depend on weather and the climate conditions. 
we decide based on the climate, what we want to eat and when we want to eat. So we look at the weather insights into um, as, a, as a imperative for all the agri uh, users at all level of supply chain, uh, you know, at every stage. So I'll request you to move to the next slide, please. Now, when we talk about weather data, um, as I earlier said, we want to make this as a real intelligence. AI will get artificially ingested great data sets. So we do a lot of hard work and heavy lifting in building this weather parameters. This is not simple. Uh, and what's most incredible today is that you have your mobile phone, you put a lat long and you dashingly get a 15 day forecast today through the weather company, weather channel app. Now, it's always wonderful to know what brings this together. And let me just take you through a bit of technology here on how the internet of things really come together for how we build this up. So we get a lot of data from a crowdsourced website called Weather Underground. Um, this is people like you and me probably putting a weather station somewhere on their house or an office and feeding the data in this platform. Um, and we use this data for validating what's really happening as long as your calibrations are right and so on. Um, then we get a lot of data from over 50,000 flights which fly every 24 hours at various heights across the world. Uh, we also get data from your smart mobile and devices and sensors networks, which today have an ability to give you a sense of pressure with gyrometer barometers in it. And pressure really decides the physics of the atmosphere. And we take all this with our amazing team of almost 100 meteorologists who take it into propriety models and give us a weather data relating to a client we are addressing. So it would be agriculture here as a focus, but uh, having said that, we do serve many other B2B businesses, uh, including energy, airlines, aviation, local road, transport, et cetera. Now, all this thing comes together in a way to give us data for any 500 square meter uh, grid on the surface of the earth every 15 minutes. So I request you to move to the next slide. Now, if we pixelate the earth into, you know, half a square kilometer, you get 2.2 billion points. And on a good day, or let me say on a bad day of a weather, we actually deal with more than 26 billion API calls in 24 hours. Now, a good guess here would be uh, to check what is the relevance of this number. So, uh, you know, all of us use uh, the famous search engine Google, um, and you can Google for an answer that how many searches it gets in 24 hours. The last time I checked was around 6.9 billion searches across the world. And we are doing three times of that when we are talking about 24 billion plus API calls or address. Um, request you to move to the next slide, Raghu. Now, we are not satisfied with just this because weather insight has to improve when we have such August panels and our clients who often come to us about um, you know, talking about the quality of the data, the, uh, the surety of the prediction for their actionable work. It's important for us to be really conscious that are we doing the best in the world, which is possible with today's science and physics. So this is where IBM really did a wonderful job. We announced this model called Graph, which is the IBM Global High Resolution Atmospheric Forecasting System. This is by far the biggest uh, supercomputer with, enabled with IBM Cloud which is now comparing data from, uh, compiling data from various sources as I displayed. And now what we've done is earlier, we used to take a 10 kilometer grid in the atmosphere and downsize that to 500 square meters. But now we take the grid of three kilometers, which means that our compute capacity has to improve many times. Uh, our ability to uh, get the inputs and through the output also has to improve. And this takes immense amount of energy when we talk about computing power and the cloud power. So thankfully the IBM Power 9, as well as the IBM Cloud makes this happen and Graph functions fully on that. Uh, Raghu request you to move to the next slide, please. And this is what uh, the uh, graph looks like. So, you know, uh, on the right side, you see the Indian Peninsula. On the left side, you see graded clouds and the right side, you see slightly more pixelated clouds. Now, this is what difference happens that earlier I was able to say in 10 kilometers atmospheric area coming down to the earth, there would be some 
thunder, some rain, etc. But now I can go further precise to a three kilometer grid and give you more power. So people who are interested in the compute power can read more on the slide. Um, but the whole essence is this is this is really the most powerful weather predicting model today. And we are uh, collaborating uh, with universities and NCAR to make this work. Um, can I request you to move to the next slide, Raghu? Now, what brings this too is our B2C business. Uh, if you use any of the popular phones or search engines um, or social networking sites and you're looking for whether this is where uh, we provide the data and um, you know people people do stand by the accuracy of this data feed. Um, I'll request you to move to the next slide, Raghu, please. So where do we go from here? So we, we are trying to solve the weather problem and in India specifically when we talk about weather Farmers are only interested in the predictability of rains and the, when the rain will happen, how much will they happen and how they have to plan around either irrigation or whatever. Now, that is something which we are really solving very well and you will see it more when I talk about the disruption we are doing in ag tech. Um, so ag tech is a complex subject. I know a lot of us are trying to solve. A lot of us are getting to a point of at least some sense of what we are trying to approach and do. And, um, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a good sign. And we see this with a lot of our clients. So in agriculture, essentially what we are trying to do is really looking at what are the challenges on data side, because we are not farming experts at IBM. We are good in data assessment and data processing and providence. And then we let our clients do the next level, which is either advisory on how things will grow, how they will be managed, et cetera. So we divide this whole problem into two parts and Raghu, I'll request you to move to the next slide, please. Now we call this problem of controllable variables and uncontrollable variables. The controllable variables are totally in our control. You know, we will decide as a farmer what I have to do basis the situation, but what the farmer is dependent on is how can I make the controllable variables predictable? And that's where the good data, the good compute, uh, the good AI comes in. And this is really where IBM is focusing. So having working on the weather data, now we are looking at how do we solve the other parameters which are extremely critical, whether you're talking about pest management, you're talking about irrigation management, you're talking about an A or B type of crop, you're talking about climate change based changes, a uh, variety of things. And this is where uh, the Watson AI comes in piece where we are building an API set, which helps at a hyper local level for a farmer to see his or her farm, and then also figure out what are these under controllable variables are doing so that I can take actions in the next three to five to nine to 10 to 12, 15 days. And of course, if I'm looking forward as a corporate, I can look at what are the seasonal changes uh, for example, what the monsoon would be like next year. So things like that. So, um, so this is where we divide the problem into data sets. And then how do we, uh, you know, permeate these data sets into applications and solutions people are trying to build further in the agriculture ecosystem. So Raghu, I'll request you to move to the next slide, please. And this is a bit of a eye chart, sorry, but the green variables which you see are our products, which we provide as APIs. Uh, to various uh, applications, right from weather to soil, um, to lightning detection, probabilistic weather, um, historic weather, which is really critical for data scientists to really use because when we're looking at all this AI and ML bit coming together, you need good data. And in historical data, we also do something very specific, which is really unique to us as we, we have a data set called clean historical, because when you're capturing the data, Sometimes some sensors may fail, some data may not be right. So what we do is when we build that historic data sets, we go and plug the gaps, which were probably due to some network and availability or uh, sensor uh, disablement. And that clean historical is actually uh, a love of life for the data scientists working on ag tech and lifestyle uh, products today in the ecosystem, which we see in India and abroad. Um, so this is a snapshot, uh, all this data is available on our website, but the whole point is there, we are just getting very specific to what anyone would need and then divide the data. So it's not one generic data, there's a lot of specialist data which people can use. So uh, Raghu, request you to move to the next slide, please. Uh, Raghu, next slide, please. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, this is a video. And, and Himanshi, if I may request, we are slightly running out of time. Okay. This, this pretty much we the should last wrap up in a couple of minutes. Yeah, this is just the last one. Second last one, I'm sorry. So this is a visual view of all what I have said is important. So right from drop stress, weather, alerts, western disease, yield production, which is which is again very important thing. These are all the things which are available. I know this is pretty much which everyone today claims as things which are available, but uh, it just depends what's the quality and the quantum of data being assessed. Uh, next slide, please, Raghu. Okay, so this is a, a, a short list of a couple of our clients who are using this data very effectively for their decision making. And, and what I showed you last was actually a dashboard. We call this the Weather Operations Center. It is one sweet shop for you to come in as a platform to use a lot of our compute capability, a lot of our data sets, and a lot of our uh, geospatial capabilities. And um, you will hear more about it as we talk. It's just recently launched. And um, this is what we um, are trying to really do in India is trying to fix the weather problem, which means, quote unquote, rain prediction uh, so, so far. Uh, but of course, when we get into the horticulture side, they are they're more specialist local climate issues, which we're also trying to track. And, um, and, and also, um, you know, when we, when we talk about the weather insights, my second chart, which I showed earlier, um, you know, this whole ecosystem uh, needs a lot of weather insights because uh, let's, let's be open about the fact that our cold chain uh, infrastructure is not really the best and we have uh, local markets to feed on. So, so weather plays an important role and that data for logistics uh, supply chain is really, really relevant. So uh, that's pretty much it, Raghu. I think I have a one last slide uh, or I'm done. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, so um, let me, yeah. So thanks everyone. Um, it's, uh, it's amazing the kind of work that's happening from getting data on the ground to bringing various types of data together on large platforms and building uh, tools, both for farmers as well as uh, the programs and the administrators. Uh, it's quite exciting. Uh, we have, uh, unfortunately, just maybe three to four more minutes before we wrap this up. But I do want to take a couple of questions that have come in from, um, from the audience. Uh, so the first question uh, is, how can AI be used to improve uh, soil health? Is there a role AI can play? And I'm going to actually pass the turn. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm not sure if Dr. Praveen Rao is able to take this question or, um, or perhaps uh, Srikant, uh, do, you have a, do you have any ideas on this? Yes, please. Um, right now, government has done soil health cards for almost entire India. So we have the geolocations and, net, and any platform we can actually customize a soil test based recommendation based on the soil health cards, which is possible now because of AI, we can pick up that from the data sets that are already existing and then translate it into a meaningful recommendation actually, which a farmer can use for their plot crop wise. Actually, this is possible right now. Sir, uh, you can add, sir, you are the expert. Yeah. Sure. No, basically, actually, what we have to do is historically the yield data, the soil data has to be mapped. And then we have to find out the soil fertility across the grids, small grids, and then uh, and, uh, analyze it and then uh, use the uh, precision tools to uh, improve the situation. This is what uh, we have to do, and that is possible through artificial intelligence. I would like to add here that the minimum <coughs> algorithms of suggesting fertilizers for soil based on the nutrient values, um, that has been inbuilt in the soil health card. So uh, from government Great. side, uh, I was heading the technical solution. So we have inbuilt. So on the portal, when you see soil health card, it's with the recommendation of fertilizer or organic uh, components to be added based on the 12 nutrient values. So those algorithms are inbuilt. That's great. 
So uh, perhaps just one final question. Uh, is it possible to protect crop from disaster uh, through AI? And I'll, I'll, I'll pass this on to the, Dr. Debashish. Sure. So uh, some of the major disasters are basically weather related, right? And I believe uh, major weather companies like IBM and DTN and the others are giving a fairly reasonably accurate weather forecast from four to 15 days, hourly weather forecast, right? So they are AI ML algorithms, which can take your current state, which is perfectly normal, uh, combined with the weather, combined with the satellite and tell how much damage will be there. Right? And not only that, let's say that you are facing a heavy rainfall and flooding, right? You have technology, uh, cloud penetrating radar to really estimate right at that point of time, how much your field is flooded and how much water stress, excess water over here, or in case of less water, how much basically drought stress you are experiencing. And again, based on the weather, do you really need to water now or just leave it alone so that the, when the rain will come, your crop will still come, uh, will be sleep okay. So combination of satellite, weather, and AIML and your current state can give a reasonable prediction 15 days in advance. Great, thank you. With that, actually, uh, it's, it's a shame, but we wish we had more time uh, to go into a deeper discussion about the various things you have shared. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for making time for this. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, time to wrap up. But before we wrap up, uh, we have a short recorded uh, talk by uh, Mr. Ranveer Chandra, uh, Chief Scientist, Azure Global at Microsoft. Um, I'll, with this, I'll hand over to the control room team. And after that, ma'am, uh, Dr. Ranjana Nagpal uh, will wrap up the session. Does that make sense, ma'am? Yes, sure. Okay. All right. With that, thank you, everyone, for joining joining us for this uh, great panel. Dr. Anandan set it up really well. Uh, Dr. Praveen Rao uh, really gave us a good landscape of challenges. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, Srikant Devasish showed great demos. And uh, Kanchan and Himanshu, thank you for sharing a big picture view of the platforms and all the data that has to come together and all the different types of solutions that actually have to uh, take shape for us to have an impact for really the farmers who are at the heart. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Raghu. Thank you, Dr. Nagpal, and thank you, the panelists. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ranbir Chandra. I'm the Chief Scientist of Azure Global at Microsoft. And today I will talk about a project I started at Microsoft called FarmBeats. The goal of FarmBeats is to enable data-driven agriculture. That is, we want to help address the world's food problem. The world needs more food. It needs more nutritious food. And the food needs to be grown without hurting the environment. The soils are not getting any richer. The water levels are uh, going further down. One of the most promising approaches to address this problem is that of data-driven agriculture. One of the things that data-driven agriculture could enable is it could help, for example, enable techniques like precision agriculture. You could map every farm in the world to see what it looks like. For example, what is the soil moisture level six inches below the ground? What is the soil temperature level? If you could build maps like this, you could then apply water only where it is needed, pesticide only where it is needed, nutrients only where, where it is needed. And not just precision agriculture. In fact, the entire food value chain, all the way from input suppliers to equipment vendors, to farmers, to the food processors, to the logistics companies, to the, uh, to the retail stores, to the consumer. If you, each one component in the agriculture value chain could benefit if it starts getting data and then using that data to improve its efficiencies. In fact, much more data, much more value can be unlocked if this data could be shared across the different components in the food value chain. That is, for example, 
if a grower knows what a consumer wants or what price, uh, what commodity is going to sell at the maximum price, the, the grower can grow the right components. Similarly, logistic companies can plan better if it knows what seeds are being grown where by which grower. The market linkages could be improved. You can imagine scenarios where there is outcome-based pricing, sustainability, for example, you could then quantify which grower is using what practices in their farm and what is the amount of carbon that is sequestered in soil. All of this is possible if you could start using data, not just to improve the efficiencies of every component in the food supply chain, but in addition to that, the data could be shared across the different components in the entire food supply chain. So the thing is, data-driven agriculture, just if you look at the production side of agriculture, data-driven agriculture has been shown to improve benefits to bring, uh, for example, with precision agriculture. It helps improve productivity, your plants grow better. It helps reduce costs because the farmer needs less water, he needs less pesticide. It's also better for the environment. For example, the farmer is not wasting any water. They are not wasting any pesticide. Despite all of these benefits, precision agriculture as a technology hasn't really taken off. In fact, data-driven agriculture hasn't taken off. And one of the biggest reasons this technology hasn't taken off is the cost of existing data-driven agriculture solutions. In fact, just to put this point in perspective, I was attending an expo at University of California, Davis, a few years back, and the cheapest sensor package were five sensors for $8,000 and a recurring cost. At that price point, which grower is going to adopt a data these sensors? What is the ROI of putting some of these sensors in the farm? So when I had started the Farm Beats program, one of the key goals was to make the entire data-driven agriculture package more, uh, more affordable for, for the growers. And not just for the growers, but everyone in the food supply chain. And as part of that, we started addressing some of the core problems around data-driven agriculture. One was around how do you get data from different parts of the food value chain? For example, from the farm, from the food processors, from the cloud? How do you bring all of these data streams together in one place? And the second piece that we started doing on top of this was how do you start bringing artificial intelligence, not just to see what's going on now using sensors or drones or satellite data, but being able to predict what's going to happen in the future. So towards that, we have been innovating on various technologies. For example, one of the challenges in bringing AI to or to data-driven agriculture is how do you get data from the middle of the farm? Your farm is far remote. A lot of times you don't have good connectivity. So one of the technologies that I have been working on for several years is this technology called TV white spaces. What the TV white spaces enables is imagine if you have a Wi-Fi router that you could access a few miles away. Right now, as soon as you exit your house, your Wi-Fi disappears. And the way we did that was we took Wi-Fi signals and put them in unused TV channels. This is TV you watch using over-the-air antennas. You know, when you browse through and browse through TV channels with over-the-air antennas, on some channels you get a transmission. On the other ch TV channels, all you see is white noise. And with this technology, you could overlay Wi-Fi signals in empty TV channels. This was one of the innovations. And the interesting thing about farms is that TV towers are in cities and most of these farms, the TV channels are just not in use. So you have a lot of capacity. We are talking of up to half a gigabit per second of available capacity to start transmitting data from the middle of the farms. This was one of the ways you could start getting data from the middle of the farm at low cost. Another thing was rather than transmitting all of the data from the farm to the cloud, you could start using edge compute so that you're doing processing in the farm and in the farm or close to the farm, say multiple farms together, you're doing edge compute processing there and only sending summaries to the cloud where you then merge with other data streams. For example, with satellite data, with weather data, with soil data, 
to start providing additional insights to the grower. So this is one thread of how do you start getting large amounts of data to power your artificial intelligence scenarios, your artificial intelligence applications for agriculture. Now, the other thing is with data-driven agriculture, we want to be able to get a lot of data for the farm. So for example, the vision, one of the vision that I'm extremely passionate about is if you really want to enable these data-driven applications for say horticulture or outdoor crops in general, broad acre crops, you want to be able to build a map of your farm. What does my farm look like at every, every inch in the farm? If you have to build such a map at any instant in time, in the past and be able to predict in the future, and not just on above the farm, what you can see, but also below the farm, below the soil, where the roots are, you want to be able to map that and see what does my farm look like? What has it looked like in the past and what will it look like in the future? If you can create that kind of a digital twin of your farm, that can power a lot of artificial and intelligence applications. However, building this kind of a digital twin of your farm is very difficult. You just can't put a sensor everywhere in the farm. Say, suppose you wanted to build, say, a soil moisture map. What is my soil moisture level six inches below the soil throughout the farm? You would need to put a sensor say, every 10 meters, which is just not going to happen. This is where artificial intelligence could help. One of the things we had developed as part of Farm Beats was it can then combine different data streams. For example, you could have a few sensors in the farm. These are sensors measuring soil moisture. And then we use artificial intelligence to start making intelligent predictions of what these values are in other parts of the farm. Similarly, not just for sensors and satellite data. In another work, we've combined data from sensors and weather stations. In another work, we've combined data from different satellites, from radar satellites and optical satellites. So this is one of the things that we really need in agriculture. If we want to enable data driven agriculture powered by AI, we need new ways to gather large amounts of data from the farm, the ground truth data, and we need to be able to combine different data streams to start providing these views, providing these new insights. And we are working on this as part of the Farm Beats program, working with various companies, various partners, such as Land or Lakes. Um, we've signed uh, agreements with USDA, with CIRO, with several companies worldwide on leveraging Farm Beats technologies and working with partners to take it to growers. So Farm Beats is not something that goes to growers right away. It's meant for other uh, agricultural companies to start leveraging the power of data, the power of AI, the power of edge compute to start transforming agriculture. That said, I wanted to add a little bit more around artificial intelligence and the benefits of AI and the challenges. So the key thing with uh, the artificial intelligence is as good as your data. If you get good data, your AI models are good. If you get bad data, they are not. And you need good labor data. And one of the things that we have been doing is being able to get good quality data about what's happening in the farm. The other thing with AI, which we want to also mention whenever we talk of uh, artificial that is, if we are collecting data from the farm about the farmer, we want to make sure that the data is used the right way, that the data is not misused by anyone. In a work that we are doing on FarmStack, which allows different entities to share data in a secure way, in a privacy preserving way. There's some work that has happened at Microsoft Research around confidential compute, around uh, homomorphic encryption to be able to share data without, to be able to perform compute on the data without actually sharing the data, without actually seeing the data decrypted in clear space. And that's something which I think we need to keep working on new ways to enable that, new ways in which data is not only used by every entity, say a farmer to improve its, his or her own efficiencies, but the data can be shared by other people in the food value chain, other entities, other organizations, and that can then unlock new value and help us get to a future in which 
we can feed the world in a responsible, sustainable way using all the powers of data and artificial intelligence. Thank you. With this, we come to end of today's session. Um, I would like to once again thank Mr. Raghu for moderating the session and fitting treasure of information in such a short span of time. And we also hope many more such associations with you, your organization, and all other panelists. On behalf of my team, I thank Mr. Raghu and all the panelists who are present, esteemed panelists of this session. Uh, I hope the participants must have been benefited from these presentations and discussion. Interestingly, the most unique thing in agriculture sector is that it provides huge opportunities for innovators and researchers for developing and implementing applications around AI. With these words, we close the session and let's continue our efforts for bringing the benefits of AI to the farming community. Thanks and bye. Thanks, Dr. Anandana. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, man. Cheers. Okay, thank you very Bye. much. Bye.